Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. So today we're going to talk about the Double Diamond Triangle Saga. That's right, a lot of people have uh, asked about it, wanted to know if I'm going to cover it, because I, I guess they've said it's non-canonical now. Uh, this is 1377, by the way, already into another year, and, and I don't know, I mean... I guess it's one of those things, you know, we we could probably parse this for hours, right? The idea of, like, for instance, how did Netheril fall? From what I've heard, there are, like, three conflicting reasons given in the rule books versus different stories. And to me, it's kind of like, uh, the world is big enough that I, I feel as if conflicting stories can exist, and that's not really a problem for me. It's It's more an issue of, like, Say, for instance, if, if, if Paul S. Kemp had conflicting issues or conflicting stories within his novels alone, then it would be a bigger issue for me. Or if, say, oh man, I don't know, what, what's a good example? You know, if Return of the Arch Wizards and the, uh, the, what was it called? Cloak of Shadows or whatever, uh, Greenwood's trilogy that went along with that. If that had conflicting ideas between them, considering they're supposed to be kind of going on at the same time and involving the same sort of stuff, that would be an issue. Whereas this massive world over, you know, 30, 40, whatever the hell we are at years now with it, you know, that doesn't bother me so much. But, whatever. I didn't see anything in here that I, I thought would be too huge of a, a cut from canon. We'll go through it here. The other thing, by the way, it's, it's, it's September 8th when I'm recording this. It's been a while since my last recording. Uh, the big reason is, won't go into this too much, but I, I had a kidney stone and had to deal with that, and it was a lot worse than I thought it would be. I don't want to go into the details. It's, it sucks. And for some reason, while I was recuperating, the only thing that I wanted to read was old fantasy, and so, like, like, 80s fantasy, and so, uh, I've, I've caught up on David Eddings, Raymond Feist, that sort of stuff, and I thought, oh, it'll be fun, I'll, I'll do little mini reviews of that, but I've got so many notes on this, this friggin' saga, and, uh, you know, if you're curious, you can follow me on Goodreads, I've put the link before, I think I'm just Zen Michael, it's uh, gordoncole at gmail.com is the email address, so check that out if you're at all curious. I'm trying to write reviews for everything that's not the realms uh, that I read on there that's new. I can't, you know, I have like 1,200 books in my library and some of the stuff that I read over a decade ago. I'm not going to go try and fill in all those blanks, but yeah, whatever. Double Diamond Triangle Saga. <laughs> so... Uh, I'm assuming this came out, I was going to look it up, I, I might have even looked it up, but I don't remember now. I'm assuming this probably came out trying to write on the coattails of, like, Green Mile, uh, when Stephen King did that serialized novel format. I, I think that's a, a really good idea. I, I like the idea. And once I realized that these were short novels, I was like, oh, I'll just fly through them. But, oh, man, when you've got six books and they're all, like, 100, 120 pages, it's still, like, almost a trilogy's worth. And so, it took a while longer than I thought. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's, let's go through them. You know, and, and just as a side note, this thing's like Green Mile. It's like, it's old like hotcakes. And then everybody was like, oh, serialized novels are hot. Let's do it. And it's like, nobody stopped to be like, maybe this only worked because it's Stephen King, you know? Maybe only because he's like the best selling author out there were people willing to pay $18 for a novel, essentially, you know? And it's like, uh, so, of course, there were all of these uh, things that came out along with it, and they didn't really go anywhere. I really think, uh, and, and I, I, I'm sure people are doing it now, but I really think that the Kindle format makes this a, a better way to go about it. You know, you can have shorter books come out with them more often, and, and now it'd just be like 99 cents or whatever, right? Anyway, okay. So let's start in the triangle with one, The Abduction by J. Robert King. I thought this was fun. Characters were really well established. Peregrine Paladin Suck is getting married, which I guess we care about. It's maybe a little too obvious what the real motivation for the bride's capture is here, but even knowing we'll have like six books of misdirection coming up, I'm cool with that. And just so you know, I wrote these notes as I was reading each book, and when I wrote that, I was like, the bride is evil and involved in some sort of plot, so I was not too far off. Two is The Paladins by James M. Ward and David Wise. It's fun to see Miltiades and Kern get screen time again. Really odd that nearly a quarter of the book is a time-wasting fetch quest. Too many damn characters. 
Really enjoying Knopf, uh, more with each book. And uh, this is so 2E, like, shockingly so. And I'm going to comment more on that once I get to the end of the whole thing, but yeah, wow. That was the first point where I put that note. Three, The Mercenaries by Ed Greenwood. Too many damn characters, too Ed Greenwoody. Yo-ho-hum. <laughs> Four, Aaron and Mercy by Roger E. Moore. Holy shit, our paladins dumb. They're just like big annoying bears who go about disrespecting everyone but saying it's for God. This really makes the paladins appear to be idiots. Too many damn characters, and this book really made me hate them all, except for Knopf and, I think, Jacob, who seemed to have at least an iota of sense about him. Also, like, the fun Doigan dagon dagon mashup, the fact that the Emperor is a friggin' Cthulhu creature, or he kind of, what I was picturing are the aliens from Torchwood, insert baby here, which is also known as Children of Earth. I thought that was a cool section. Five, An Opportunity for Profit by Dave Gross. Dave Gross makes a valiant go at making the 800 pirate characters separate and interesting, but it's difficult. Not terrible, but mostly filler leading up to the big reveal at the end of it, which is also revealed in the first chapter of Book 6, which, by the picture on the website, looks as if it should be concurrent with these two books. So, like, what I did is I read Book 1, and then I read 2 and 3 together, and then I read 4, 5, and 6 together, or I started to, because if you look at the way the triangle, the the diamond is set up, it looks as if 4, 5, and 6 happen at the same time. That's not the case. Six happens after five, so it's really not a diamond at all. It's like a, I don't know, a a figure eight or something set on its side. In any case, uh, there's a big reveal at the beginning of uh, book six, which I was reading at the same time as four and five, and it was like, boy, that, that seems like, you know, it's like it starts off with both the groups from four and five meeting up, and they look like shit, and then they get in a fight, and two people die, and then there's a big reveal, and it's like, Maybe I should wait on this one. Yeah, so end of book five, there's a huge reveal. But back to book five. It's nice how this dovetails with book four. A couple of the party are Mar uh, from Dwegan, and they have fishy bits, which could have helped out the paladins in book four. Probably not, though. They're so goddamn dumb and annoying. Also, there's one really good bit in here where Belmar sounds like who he's supposed to be beyond just being a badass. It's a chapter where he's discussing loyalty versus a contract. And at that point, since I had read the beginning of Book 6, I had it spoiled already who it was. And I'll go ahead and tell you, Artemis Entreri uh, is the uh, pirate leader through all of Book 3 and 5. But there's this great uh, par- er, this great section where he discusses, you know, loyalty to other people versus fulfilling a contract. And it just really reminded me of stuff that Salvatore did... I believe later, you know, the timeline here is kind of confusing because this was obviously written earlier, but I believe did later in the Cell Swords trilogy, the way that he made Entreri kind of always open to debating what is might, what is justice, and, and it seemed like what is loyalty would be something that he would enjoy discussing. Six, Conspiracy by J. Robert King. Oh my god, the boss of the pirates is Artemis Entreri. Spoiler! If I'm not mistaken, it's been nine years since we've last seen him doing something, so I suppose it's possible he's hanging out as a pirate captain. And oh boy, the paladins are made to look like even bigger idiots. Why does this series despise paladins so? Also, they appear to be spawning like Mogwai. Trandon, Jacob, did they exist in book two? Apparently they did, since I made a note about Jacob. Nov continues to be the only character. And when I say character, I mean the only one who's, like, more than one-dimensional. Hey, the really obvious plot point from book one pays off here. Pidgeotto's fiancé was evil! Gasp! Says nobody. Book seven, Uneasy Alliances by David Cook and Peter Archer. 20% of this is wasted on bad editing between book six and seven. Was Knopf healed or not? Here the parties switch up, and uh, one of them goes after the Blood Forges. That party includes Entreri, whose entire contract was to kill Idola, uh, the princess who's marrying what's-his-name. So that seemed a little silly. Anyway, the other party goes after Idola. But yeah, it, 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 like seriously, 20% of this is like the paladins being like, I don't have any healing spells, which at the end of book six, they did, and they healed off, and we were ready to go with the plot. But instead, we futz around for 20% of this book, hanging out, trying to figure out if we're going to be able to save Knopf's life. 
Number 8, Easy Betrayals by Richard Baker. Oh, you know I won't let you down and not include some classic Baker dialogue. There sadly wasn't that much in here because his bad guy or whatever is Idola and they're mainly just chasing her the whole time. I think she says insolent paladins at one point or something along that line, but uh, my favorite was here. Not bad, she remarked. I see that Pyrgeron didn't waste his time with amateurs, excepting that boy Knopf anyway. Why is that qualifier in there? It's just hilarious. Entreri's arm becomes a skeleton arm. This will obviously have long-lasting and important ramifications. One of the never-before-seen paladins is a doppelganger. One is a Cormir war wizard. Entreri gets fascinated by blood forges. People die, but not really. There, there is one moment here where one of the characters who was finally kind of starting to come into his own gets killed, and I was like, oh my god, Richard Baker really pulled that off pretty well, and then chapter later he shows up and he's okay. And I was like, seriously, like, did we really give a damn about the, like, pirate in the long run that we had to keep him alive? It just seems silly. 9. The Diamond by J. Robert King. Everything ends here. It all leads to this, whether it's a diamond or not. It all it all comes down to book 9. From the Borskir Brothers near Krupp from Malazan books, level of dialogue to the guards' dying soliloquy, King really knocks this out of the park. He's by far the best writer out of the bunch, though it is probably an easier job doing the beginning and ending of a series like this. Something that I forgot to mention at the beginning is we got some Blackstaff in here. That's right, that's right. Books 1 and 9, Blackstaff is in the house. All right. Though I heard he was responsible for that uh, that STD scare a few years ago, so shame on you, Blackstaff. One odd bit of, <laughs> of dialogue in this. I'm sure there is more, but one that just really stood out to me. I've been where there are no shadows at midday because the sun is right overhead. That's somebody trying to point out how worldly they are. There they are. I, I I would think it would show that you're more worldly if that wasn't the case. I mean, where isn't the sun right overhead at midday? I've I've been where you don't have a shadow because the sun's over your head in the middle of the day. Well, okay. And then as an example of the Borskir brothers, you could really take just about anything they do. But uh, here's a little um, here's a little thing Knopf is 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 uh, kind of pontificating upon how he is trying to be a hero, but uh, being a hero doesn't get you anywhere. The Borskir brother says, "But heroes don't get any monetary renunciation. If they did, they'd be just missionaries, mercenaries." Knopf corrected reflexively. "Yes, that's it. Mercy killers, mercenaries." Knopf snarled. People who fight for money. Mercenaries. Bessel nodded amiably. Yes, mammonaries. <laughs> the, uh, and I mean, it keeps going on, which is why being a hero doesn't provide a fellow the fine enmities of lordly life. Amenities. It just keeps going on like that. And I think that's such a, uh, a difficult skill to have to make a character say things incorrectly, but in a way that says what they're really thinking. Or uh, that shows at least that they know what the person they're talking to is really thinking. I mean, that's just... It, it had to have taken a really long time to figure out how to word that correctly. And I, I was really impressed. I, I uh, J. Robert King, I basically know, is that guy who did some crappy magic novels. But now I'm like, maybe I need to take a second look at those magic novels. Because this is really good. The end of it is, you know, when Trary's arm gets healed, so... It's really as if he wasn't involved in this at all. Idola dies, and, and it, the whole Idola thing is just bizarre because it's like Blackstaff and all the others are like, yeah, I knew she was an evil doppelganger, but we put a chastity belt on her that made her good. So it was safe for her to get married and bear children through Pidgeotto, and it's like, the hell sort of logic is that? Like, nobody seemed to have thought this through very well at all. I, I I don't know what was up with that. Oh, and then his first wife or girlfriend, yeah, wife, is suddenly brought back to life because of magic or some bullshit, and so now he's married to her, and they're all happy and blah, 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 and I'm just like, well, I guess it was cool to see Waterdeep again uh, before we shunt into fourth edition because I, I honestly don't know if anything else that we're looking at is going to go to Waterdeep. But uh, overall, 
you know, I, I, I don't even get why we needed to make this non-canon. Maybe it'll, you know, maybe the next time we see Entreri in the, um, uh, the Driz books, it'll be like, and he was absolutely doing this for the past decade or what have you. <laughs> but it really just felt like, eh, you know, I mean, you, you could take it or leave it overall. Uh, I, I guess it kind of changes things in the Utter East uh, for, for a fair amount, but it's not like we've ever dealt with them at all before in any way that I remember. So, yeah, fun little experiment. I, I don't think it was horrible. I mean, the only one that I... Uh, just could not make it through at all was the Mercenaries by Ed Greenwood, but that's no great surprise, right? And Uneasy Alliances. So two out of nine were pretty much unreadable, but uh, the other seven were, were decent. It kind of, you know, even when I don't like these experiments like War of the Spider Queen or whatever, uh, I, I, I still enjoy that they gave it a shot. Let me just make another note that the, it, it was overall very, very odd suddenly going back to 2E style. When we transition from 2E to 3E, it, it's not as noticeable, especially because you have the people like Troy Denning, etc., who were basically writing 3E stuff back when it was 2E, and, and, and he was tapped to handle the transition through Return of the Archwizards. And you had all the Sembia stuff, which, yeah, was a little more personal and everything, but it still had a very, I, I, you know, it still felt 2E enough that it wasn't jarring. And you had stuff like the Watercourse Trilogy, which had a more modern feel, but they, they you know, book one was firmly set in 2E, uh, maybe a little into 3E, and so it felt like, you know, we got, um, reading it chronologically, it felt peppered through. Now, however, we've been on 3E for quite a while, and suddenly to be thrown back into this, like, fetch quest, paladins are idiots sort of way of thinking is really jarring, and it didn't quite hold up very well. And since it really doesn't seem to mean a hell of a lot, except for, you know, I, I mean, if, if Piergeron, I think he appears in, like, City of Splendors or whatever, so, like, if you read this series right after City of Splendors, which is at least a little bit earlier in the chronology, I think that would probably help out a lot more. And it wouldn't really change anything one way or the other. I guess then and Trary would probably be doing stuff somewhere else. But, you know, maybe it's just like Wolverine. He gets around, you know. Oh, well, that was another thing I wanted to point out. Everybody recognizes Entreri as the most uh, most well-known assassin on the Sword Coast. And I'm like, okay, I guess I could buy that Blackstaff knows who the most famous assassin on the Sword Coast is. But... It's like Miltiades and Kern, two paladins. Like, you would think that the most famous assassin would be not known by anyone, basically. Uh, except, like, you know, somebody who can do tons of magic and is seeking one out, which we find out the Blackstaff hired him, so it's like, yeah, okay, that kind of makes sense. But why the hell do two paladins of Tyr who don't get out of Flan know who the most famous assassin on the Sword Coast is? By sight. You know, that just seems kind of silly to me. In any case, that's it for now. Next up, we're going to take a look at uh, the Pirate King. But for now, this is Michael T. Bradley. Realms Remember.